In 2001, Savoir built a lifter with six sides and mounted it vertically on a gimbling system. A gimbal is, you know, basically just a device that lets the thing rotate. So he uses a kitchen fan that's about three feet away from this, turns the fan on, it's hitting the lifter at an angle, so the lifter begins to spin, right? It's just air pressure spinning it around a circle. Well, he lets it get up to around 20 RPM, and that's, that's pretty fast. It's moving at a good clip, he's managed to balance it so it's not bouncing all over the place. And then he turns the power on. And keeping in mind that he'd built the system so that the upward thrust didn't, didn't stop the bearings or anything. He'd suspended it with that in mind. The lifter, within a quarter of a turn, completely stops moving. So then he turns the power off, the lifter begins to spin again. Now, the obvious complaint about this experiment is it's airflow, right? This space charge that we're creating around the corona wire is just dragging enough air with it that the fan can't spin at all. So he figured he would uh, beat the critics at their own game, put the entire thing in an enclosure and did the same thing with the same result. So lifters create their own inertial field, but at the same time, they're not doing the kind of inertial nullification that we see from pretty much any UFO report out there, right? They can stop on a dime. They can do a right angle turn going Mach 25, 30, you know, whatever the claim may be. Um, they, they accelerate at speeds that are almost like they're not entirely in our dimension. And the true anti-gravity, this nonlinear effect, be it unified field theory, Heim theory is another possibility. There, you know, maybe the theory hasn't been written yet. These effects occur in such a manner that the normal rules don't apply. And I think what they are leading us ultimately towards are probably warp drives, as strange as it sounds. Um, I guess the short example of that would be Miguel Alcubierre, right, he's a British physicist, published a paper, I think this was 94. Alcubierre suggested that if you could use, I believe it was negative energy, within conventional relativity theory, you could bend time space to allow a ship to travel within a light cone. So even though you can't go faster than the speed of light, in his view, you can still travel faster than the speed of light by bending space. He said the only problem is we need this negative mass or negative energy to do it. Since it doesn't exist, it's a thought experiment. And he kind of wrote it off as the Star Trek warp drive that'll never work. Well, the problem becomes to get this negative energy, negative mass, if you use the unified field theory in place of conventional relativity theory, which is, in fact, why Einstein wrote the thing in the first place, these, these uh, I don't know what they call it, fanciful requirements go out the window, and you can begin to look at large-scale modifying of time and space, um, maybe even someday leading towards large-scale quantum tunneling. Right now, they've been able to quantum, uh, teleport quantum states across a lab. Um, because of the way the theory grew up and it was modeled, it's always been assumed that quantum mechanics would, would, would somehow prevent these large-scale effects from happening. Right? They talk about wave coherence and all sorts of quantum mechanics effects that only work in a small scale. It's possible that by being able to modify the time-space continuum using the nonlinear theories that we're working on today, maybe possibly brain theory, actually, as a good modern example, uh, we could begin to move towards the really far out stuff. What, what theory was that? Uh, brain theory. Uh, string, sorry, string theory, brain theory. Um, derived originally Michio Kalkus, but there are a lot of people who have participated lately on it. It is picking up some of the slack. I guess Kalku originally, when he started working on this, he's described his passion for it as coming from Einstein's unified field theory. Um, again, I'm trying to skim, and I should apologize, because there's so much back information here. And I, well, I know it sounds like I have a lot of it memorized, but I miss bits and pieces, and I always have people come up to me later and say, you know, this isn't how that worked. But, you know, <laughs> it's close. So I'm trying to think of uh, some of the big stories that we did. Um, right now, one of the biggest is, um, th that I personally thought was interesting, Eugene Podkletnov, um, or Evgeny Podkletnov, depending on how you pronounce it, he goes by Eugene if you're writing him from the States. Um, he did the rotating superconductor that was in the press. It got him blacklisted from pretty much every Russian journal out there. Uh, got him blacklisted in the US, too. Um, because he was blacklisted, um, he, it took him about eight years to have NASA replicate the test. They never did complete it. They kind of alluded to this in the press. They said, well, we tested this rotating superconductor, and we had negative test results. I remember reading something about that. 
Well, their negative test result was when he told them to take it up to 5,000 RPM to see a two to 8% gravitational shielding effect, they took it up to 200 and because of quote unquote political pressures dropped it. So they never completed that test. Um, the Boeing, I'm sure you guys have heard about the Boeing scandal, right? Boeing was into anti-gravity. It was making all sorts of headlines. Um, they were not studying the rotating superconductor, despite what the magazines printed. They had a bunch showing a jet with a rotating superconductor in it. What they were studying was his second experiment, his second experiment which virtually no one has heard of, uh, including, weirdly enough, most of the military guys. His second experiment was a force beam generator. Now, I interviewed him in 2004. I was doing a story on Ning Li, probably the world's most famous missing gravity specialist. And I was trying to track down where she was. He's the only person who's corresponded with her. So my, you know, in my humbleness, I thought, maybe I can do an ambush interview and trying to get him to tell me right in the middle of it. So I'm in the middle of the interview. It turned out he was the one ambushing me because when I asked him about this experiment, I said, you, you were using a Marx generator, basically two, two megavolt, I think 10 megajoule or something like that. It's a lot of electricity, a lot of energy. He's pumping that through a superconductor. It's not rotating, it's a stable, static superconductor. He tried it with a coil and without, seems to work comparably with both. Now the way he published the results, he said it moved a pendulum. He, he kind of alluded to the fact that maybe it was uh, producing something like 20 pounds of force. That's kind of what it read like. So I asked him about this and I said, you know, I'd heard 20 pounds of force. That's a lot, that is remarkable for a gravity beam which isn't supposed to exist. And I, you know, I, I then asked him, could he elaborate on it? He actually corrected me and said, 20 pounds, where'd you get that figure? And I thought, well, where did I get it? You know, maybe I made it up. So I said, well, okay, what are you getting? And jokingly, I said, okay, hundreds of pounds? He said, yes, more than that. So according to Ponklinoff, and I have it on tape, it's, it's clear as a bell. I actually did a second follow-up interview to, to clarify. The claim now is that he's working in Russia, punching holes through brick and warping metal, like hitting it with a sledgehammer using basically this Mars generator discharge onto a superconductor. Now one of the wonderful things about this is Ponklinoff has been firmly planted in the alternative science community for decades, well not decades, probably one decade, last 10 years. Um, he is a very, very friendly, gracious individual. He's very supportive of all the work that we are doing to try and bring our technologies forward. Um, but he's also been trying to work to get back into kind of the good graces of some of these organizations. And one of the things that struck me about the STAFE conference was, without even having realized it, four or five of the papers they published in the last two years support his newest experiment. So I think some of these things that are coming together, again, this convergence of ideas is very profound. I actually was pretty sure that 2005 would be the year of the quote unquote big breakthrough. Um, of course, the single biggest problem remains to be funding. 